Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar on natural resource evaluations. My name is Erica Christensen and I'm with Stantec Consulting Services and I will be hosting our webinar today with the help of several staff members from FDOT's Office of Environmental Management. This webinar is going to be recorded and will be available after today on OEM's website. This webinar will be interactive and we encourage participation at the end of the presentation, we'll have an opportunity for an open question and answer session. For some housekeeping, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for reference on OEM's website. If you're watching this webinar with others, please enter names of all attendees in the chat. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the chat box to ask them. We'll have staff monitoring the chat as we go along and may pause to answer questions or they'll be addressed at the end of our presentation during the open question and answer session. The objectives of our webinar today are to discuss the latest revisions to the NRE guidance, discuss the preparation and review of NREs, and explain what technical memos are developed for. And then we'll run through in a few example situations at the end. OEM's NRE guidance and outline was updated this year to reflect the most recent version of the Project Development and Environment Manual, primarily changes to Part 2, Chapter 16, Protected Species and Habitat. These revisions clarify documentation requirements and review expectations for complying with the National Environmental Policy Act, Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Management and Conservation Act, and other federal and state laws. It also clarifies that these resource evaluations are consistent with guidance provided by the Federal Highway Administration. The NRE guidance and outline document can be found on OEM's website under Documents and Publications. The revised version will be available sometime this summer. We'll begin by discussing what types of documents should be prepared for these resource evaluations. Two types of documents may be prepared, either a natural resource evaluation or a technical memo. But how do you know what type of document should be appropriate for your project? Generally, it comes down to whether the impacts in your conclusions require review by an external agency. For example, consultation for impacts to federal or state listed species, an individual or regional general permit for wetland impacts, or an essential fish habitat assessment. If impacts to protected species and wetlands and EFH do not require external agency review, then a technical memo can be prepared and included in the project file and swept. For state-funded projects that require a federal permit, an NRE should be developed and sent to agencies as technical assistance to help streamline the permitting process. If the project is a major federal action, meaning that an environmental impact statement is being prepared, then an NRE should be developed to document natural resource impacts. However, even minor projects that constitute as a type one categorical exclusion can require an NRE if consultation is needed. If formal consultation is needed for a type one categorical exclusion, it must be initiated by OEM and the district should discuss with OEM about whether it is appropriate for the project to proceed as a type one. Documents for federal projects that require external agency review must be reviewed by OEM before submittal. NREs for non-major state actions and state environmental impact reports do not require OEM review. Technical memos also do not require OEM review. So next we'll discuss what information should be included in an NRE. All NREs should follow this outline and include discussion of these various topics. If one particular resource does not apply to your project, like essential fish habitat, then it should be noted in the document that the project has no involvement with that resource. In the next few slides, we'll discuss the content that should be included in the project overview, protected species and habitat section, wetlands evaluation, essential fish habitat, and conclusions. Additional tips may be included in the guidance document and not necessarily covered in this presentation. All NREs must include the technical report cover page to ensure that the NEPA assignment standard statement is on every document in accordance with the MOU dated December 14, 2016, 
between FHWA and FDOT. This form is available on FDOT's form management system website. In the document, you can toggle on and off the signature block for these types of technical reports. NREs do not require a signature because it is a not an engineering document. The project overview should explain what the proposed action is, including purpose and need to document the justification for the project and include discussion of existing conditions compared to the proposed final condition. Figures showing the project area and study area must be included. The study or action area should go beyond the area of immediate direct effects of the project and encompass all areas that may experience indirect or cumulative effects. Discuss how the study area was determined in your document. Generally, the project overview should include an evaluation of land use, land cover, soils, and other natural features. We recommend that figures be provided to illustrate this discussion, which may be included in line with the text or added as an appendix. If multiple alternatives are being carried forward for evaluation in the environmental document, then each alternative should be discussed in the NRE, including dis differences in alignments, typical sections, and possible design changes or construction method differences. For example, temporary bridges for replacement projects. For the protected species and habitat section, document preparers should discuss the regulatory background for the assessment. Examples of applicable laws and regulations include the Endangered Species Act of 1973, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act are all examples of federal protections, and then the state uh, Florida Endangered and Threatened Species Act for state protections. It's also important to acknowledge that evaluations are being conducted in accordance with FHWA's 2002 memorandum titled Management of the Endangered Species Act, Environmental Analysis and Consultation Process. Any prior correspondence from the agency should be included in this discussion and addressed as appropriate. Discuss the methods used to determine what species and habitat may occur in the project area including any literature or databases referenced. The outcomes of this database review should be in a table listing the common and scientific name of each species that may occur, its federal and pr state protection status, and its likelihood to occur in the project area. It's important that evaluations to protected species and habitat are consistent with FHWA's <clears throat> 2002 memorandum. The analysis should be considered in the context of the scope of the project and include ecological importance and distribution of affected species and consider the intensity of potential impacts of the project on those species. Here are three examples from different NREs across the state that demonstrate a table put together from database reviews of all the potential species that may occur in the project area. These tables include a potential or probability of occurrence. This likelihood is subjective and based on professional judgment. Thus, defin definitions must be provided to define the basis of its use. Common terms used are low, moderate, high, and observed. The differences between these categories may include examples such as low may mean it's previously documented in the county, but not known to occur in the project area and has no suitable habitat, whereas moderate may be not known to occur in the area, but suit hab suitable habitat is on site. And high may mean that it's previously documented and suitable habitat is on site, but it has not been observed. Again, these definitions are subjective and it may be slightly different for your project. In these examples, the definitions of their occurrence categories were either provided in text or as footnotes to the table. Each species must have dedicated sections where its biological background is discussed, including any relevant habitat information and life history traits. Then discuss the findings of database searches and field visits. Is the species known to occur in the area? Was it recently observed? Was habitat observed on site? What quality of habitat is available? Provide detailed information as to how the project will or will not affect the species or its habitat, either directly or indirectly. For example, will additional right-of-way clearing remove suitable habitat? 
Will construction cause noise or visual disturbances that may alter nesting or foraging behavior? Will these impacts be temporary or permanent? Based on the effects, are there any avoidance or minimization measures that can be included as part of project implementation? Examples include time of year restrictions, exclusion fencing, relocation efforts, and design modifications. In some instances, mitigation may be appropriate, like mitigation for impacts to wood stork foraging habitat. Use this analysis to make a Section 7 finding called an effect determination. For each proposed or listed species and each proposed or designated critical habitat, use an effect, determine an effect determination for each. Standard measures such as following FDOT standard specifications cannot be used to justify an effect determination. For some species, there may be programmatic keys that can be used to conclude an effect determination. Any keys must be appropriately referenced with the date and steps used to reach the conclusions. If specific avoidance and minimization measures are required to be carried out to conclude that of effect determination, ensure that those measures are included as commitments in the conclusion section. The effect determinations for federal species are no effect, may affect, not likely to adversely affect, and may affect, likely to adversely affect. Effect determinations must be made for each federal species and critical habitat. No effect means that there's no impacts, positive or negative, to listed or proposed resources. Generally, this means no listed resources will be exposed to the action and its environmental consequences. Concurrence from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or National Marine Fisheries Service is not required for no effect determinations. May affect, but not likely to adversely affect means that all effects are beneficial, insignificant, or discountable. Beneficial effects have contemporaneous positive effects without any adverse effects to the species or habitat. Insignificant effects relate to the size of the impact and include those effects that are undetectable, not measurable, or cannot be evaluated. Discountable effects are those extremely unlikely to occur. These determinations require written concurrence from the service. From, for certain programmatic keys, you may not need to obtain concurrence from the service for a MANLA determination. Be sure to read the key thoroughly to understand which conclusions require additional consultation. May affect and is likely to adversely affect means that listed resources are likely to be exposed to the action and its environmental consequences and will respond in a negative manner to the exposure. This determination requires formal consultation with the service. For FDOT projects entering into formal consultation, we typically use the NRE as the biological assessment to initiate formal consultation. Any formal consultation under the Endangered Species Act must be initiated by OEM in writing. This cannot be done by the district. The US Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service has guidance on preparing biological assessments. More detailed information may be needed in an NRE being used as a biological assessment compared to a typical NRE. For example, a detailed cumulative effects analysis that considers any ongoing or planned activities that may be affecting the species or habitat might need to be considered. We recommend reviewing the services guidance for biological assessments when preparing for formal Section 7 consultation. For state species, there are technically no effect determinations under state law for state listed species, but FDOT has created similar effect determinations to the federal ones to gauge the magnitude of project effects on state listed species. Those determinations are no effect anticipated, no adverse effect anticipated, and potential for adverse effect. FDOT coordinates with FWC and FDAX for impacts to state listed wildlife and plants. These agencies will provide comments on the project and recommend any additional measures to be considered as part of project implementation. These recommendations may become permit conditions under state issued permits. It's possible that species permits may need to be obtained from FWC for take coverage. The most common is a gopher tortoise relocation permit, but other permit needs may arise. 
refer to FWC's Imperiled Species Management Plan for species permitting guidelines or recommendations on project avoidance and minimization measures, and also for possible permitting needs for state protected wildlife. Additionally, FDOT's permit handbook is available on OEM's website and can provide helpful tips as well. Certain species may not be afforded protection under the Federal Endangered Species Act or State Threatened Endangered Species Law, but might have protections through other means. Examples include bald eagles, Florida black bears, southern fox squirrels, which is a relatively new one, non-listed bats, and migratory birds. Impacts to these species may require coordination with federal or state agencies, and in some instances, species permits may be, need to be obtained for example, an eagle permit. Avoidance and minimization measures should also be considered for these species. So now we're gonna have time for some poll questions. Um, on your screen, you should see a poll question appear and we'll take a few seconds to uh, have everyone take the opportunity to answer the question. We'll keep the polls open for another 10 seconds. Great, thanks too. So the question was, who implements the Endangered Species Act? And under the Endangered Species Act, both the US Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service has jurisdiction. And then we'll have one more question before moving on. For a federally funded transportation project, who is responsible for making effect determinations? We'll keep the polls open for another 10 seconds. Thanks, too. So for a federally funded transportation project, FDOT is responsible for making effect determinations. So next we're gonna move on and talk about the wetland evaluation. A wetland evaluation must also be included to discuss impacts to wetlands and other surface waters. Similar to the protected species section, discuss the regulatory framework governing wetlands at the beginning of this section. It's important to include reference to Executive Order 11990, USDOT Order 5660.1A, and FHWA Technical Advisory T6640.8A. Next, describe the methodology used to evaluate wetlands, both on desktop and in the field. Maps and tables are needed to convey the location of wetlands, wetland types, and acreages. Describe the wetlands in the project area, including their vegetative characteristics, physical characteristics, and quality. Evaluate the project effects, both direct and indirect, to wetlands and surface waters in the area. Will these impacts be short-term or long-term, temporary or permanent? What impacts excuse me, what avoidance and minimization measures are being implemented to minimize wetland impacts to the greatest extent practicable? Quantify the, indirect, the direct and indirect wetland impacts and assess the functional value lost as a result of the project using the uniform mitigation assessment method. 
We recommend providing these results in a table and including the UMAM worksheets as an appendix. Once impacts are evaluated, discuss how these impacts will be mitigated. Mitigation may be accomplished through a mitigation bank. Include what mitigation bank service territories the project falls in and whether there are available credits for the type of wetlands being impacted. If mitigation bank credits are not available, discuss what other mitigation options may be pursued. It's important to include applicable standard statements at the conclusion of the wetland evaluation. This includes a wetlands finding that references Executive Order 11990, a discussion of the basis for determination that there is no practical alternative to the proposed action, and a discussion of the basis of the determination that the proposed action includes all practical measures to minimize harm to wetlands in a concluding statement, which is provided here on the slide. This wetlands finding must be included in the environmental document for type two categorical exclusions, environmental assessments, or environmental impact statements. So now we're gonna have time for another poll. Two, if you could go ahead and launch that poll question for us. And we have about 10 more seconds left for the poll. Great, thanks Tim. So the executive order that should be referenced in the wetland evaluation is executive order 11990, protection of wetlands. So now we're gonna talk about essential fish habitat. Essential fish habitat is governed by the National Marine Fisheries Service under the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. EFH is habitat or for marine and anadromous fish that is necessary for their survival and reproduction. Essential fish habitat is not the same as critical habitat. EFH is for maintaining productive fisheries, particularly those that are economically important. Critical habitat, on the other hand, is for the protection of rare, threatened, and endangered species listed under the Endangered Species Act. EFH is for managed fish species, not protected fish species. The Magnuson-Stevens Act requires federal agencies to consult with NIMFs regarding impacts of their activities on essential fish habitat. This is documented through an EFH assessment provided in the Natural Resources Evaluation. If a project goes through ETDM screening, NIMS will often provide comments as to whether an essential fish habitat is needed. An essential fish habitat, evaluate, an essential fish habitat assessment evaluates what habitats may be present in the project area and how the project may impact those habitats both directly and indirectly. Benthic surveys are often conducted to do evaluate habitat presence and suitability for the types of managed fisheries in the area. For example, if the study area contains essential fish habitat for spiny lobster, then you could survey for presence of shallow subtidal bottom, seagrasses, unconsolidated bottom, live bottom habitat, or other communities necessary for lobster survival and reproduction. In the NRE, discuss what essential fish habitat is present, the project's impacts, and any avoidance or minimization measures that will be implemented. Conclude with an EFH determination as to what level of impact to EFH is anticipated. Minimal, more than minimal, but less than substantial, or substantial. At the conclusion of the NRE, provide a list of anticipated permits, Summarize the conclusions of each resource section, list out implementation measures and commitments, and next steps for agency consultation. The difference between implementation measures and commitments can be confusing, but it's essentially whether something is done as part of FDOT standard practice or not. Implementation measures are actions that FDOT carries out regardless of external agency input, such as erosion control, 
obtaining wetland permits, conducting gopher tortoise surveys or eagle surveys, and following standard, speci standard specifications for road and bridge construction. Gopher tortoises and eagles have specific permitting requirements, allowing FDOT to consider these implementation measures instead of commitments. Commitments, on the other hand, are project-specific actions that must be carried out to satisfy conditions of external agency requirements. Examples include conducting species-specific surveys like care care surveys or scrub jay surveys, following construction protection measures for various species like eastern indigo snake, manatee, sea turtles, um, or incorporating a wildlife crossing. FDOT special provisions like installing bat exclusion devices before doing bridge work can be listed as commitments because they would not be normally conducted as part of standard practice. So time for another poll question. Um, we're gonna go through a couple examples of whether you think something should be an implementation measure or a commitment. So the first one is FDOT will follow the standard manatee conditions for in-water work during project construction. We have about 10 seconds left. So it looks like the audience is 50-50 on this one. So, um, Following the standard manatee conditions for in-water work during project construction, um, that would be a commitment because it's an external agency uh, protection measure. So now we'll do uh, one more example. Uh, this example is FDOT will reinitiate consultation if listed species are discovered within the project area during design. So um, answer whether you think this one is an implementation measure or a commitment. We have about 10 seconds left on this poll. Thanks, too. So people are right, this would be an implementation measure because through obligations of the Endangered Species Act, FDOT would be required to reinitiate consultation if any discoveries as part of the project um, occurs during any point in the pro project phase. And um, this could be if listed species are newly discovered in the project area or if species are uh, newly listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, there are several triggers in which case FDOT would have to reinitiate consultation, but we would never list this as a commitment. It would be an uh, implementation measure. And if anyone has any questions about these examples, feel free to um, write your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the PowerPoint. Thanks. So now we're going to talk about NRE outcomes. So NREs, uh, once they have gone through OEM review, are sent to external agencies for review and comment. The responses of those ex external agencies are summarized in the environmental document with concurrence letters attached to the environmental document and other correspondence can be saved in the project file. For future phases and permitting, when the project advances to design and permitting, FDOT should review the NRE to determine if any project changes have occurred since the NRE was submitted to the agencies. This includes evaluating if level or amount of impacts have changed and if new species or habitat have been listed or discovered. Consultation may need to be reinitiated. This could be documented 
as such in the NRE, or reinitiation may be triggered if the project's impacts have changed. If formal consultation under the Endangered Species Act was conducted and a biological assessment was issued, the BO will give parameters dictating when consultation must be reinitiated. For a state-funded project that requires a federal permit, consultation would not have been completed in PD&E since FDOT would not be the lead federal agency. However, an NRE may have been developed and sent to resource agencies as technical assistance. This documentation should be included in permit applications to assist the lead federal agency with completing Section 7 consultation under the Endangered Species Act or consultation for EFH impacts under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. All right, now we're gonna talk about technical memos. As a reminder, technical memos are, uh, should be prepared when consultation is not required and wetland impacts do not rise to the level where an individual or regional general permit would be needed. Typically, te technical memos are prepared for type one category categorical exclusions, but it's possible that a technical memo can be used for a type 2 CE if impacts are minimal. In a technical memo, you should summarize the resource sections in a similar manner to the NREs. Refer to databases or literature that were reviewed and dates of field assessments. Ensure that all effect determinations are supported meaning that the document includes proper justification and reasoning as to why the project will not have any effects to that species. Summarize the wetland assessment and quantification of wetland impacts, and if EFH is present, provide justification that EFH will not be um, affected. Often technical memos do not have commitments, but if there are, ensure that they are carried forward by documenting them in the technical memo environmental document and entered into PSEE, the Project Suite Enterprise Edition Commitments Module. Once the technical memo is complete, upload the document to the project file in SWEPT. So now we're gonna work through a few examples. Um, these are not going to appear as poll questions, but we'll give you guys um, a scenario and you can have some opportunity to think about it and then we will uh, walk through the answers together. So the first example we'll look at is for a figurative uh, bridge replacement project in Central Florida. The project, which is federally funded, is proposing to do an in-kind replacement for a structurally deficient bridge. The project area occurs within a floodplain forest. Through database searches, we have determined that the following species may occur in the area, blue-tailed bull skink, eastern indigo snake, sand skink, Florida scrub jay, wood stork, and Florida panther. And we anticipate the following wetland impacts, two acres of forested wetland, 0.7 acres of freshwater marsh, and 0.3 acres of lakes larger than 10 acres. And uh, no essential fish habitat is within the project area. So next, let's determine what effects we think the project is going to have on these species. Project staff reviewed the outcomes of the desktop review and conducted a subsequent field assessment to evaluate the project area for suitable habitat and presence of listed species. Because we're in a floodplain forest and have no nearby documented occurrences, we've determined that the project will have no effect on blue tail mole skinks, sand skinks, and Florida scrub jays. For eastern indigo snake, we used the effect determination key for eastern indigo snakes, and through the key determined that the project may affect, not likely to adversely affect, so long as the FDOT implements the standard protection measures. So in our document, we would say that we followed the effect determination key and uh, followed the steps A, B, C to get to may affect, not likely to adversely affect. This project occurs within a core foraging area for wood storks and more than half an acre of suitable foraging habitat will be impacted, but the project is not within uh, 2,500 feet of an active colony. Through the use of the wood stork key, we determine that the project may affect, not likely to adversely affect wood storks, 
as long as suitable foraging habitat is compensated for at a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service approved wetland mitigation bank. And then finally for Florida panthers, um, there is suitable habitat and panthers are known to be in the project area based on roadkill and telemetry data and the project does occur within a panther focus area and the project is greater than one acre in size. Using the Florida panther effect determination key, we conclude that the project may affect panthers. However, impacts to habitat will be minimized to the area of the bridge and to improve the area for wildlife crossing, FDOT commits to incorporating design modifications to improve wildlife passage via shelves in the riprap. Through the min minimization of habitat impacts and improvement to wildlife crossing, we have determined that the project may affect, not likely to adversely affect, Florida panther. The anticipated permits for this project would be that the project may qualify for a general permit from the Army Corps through uh, the Regional General Permit, SAJ-92, and an individual ERP permit is anticipated based on impacts to wetlands and other surface waters. So after running through this scenario, we have a few questions for you guys to consider. Um, what type of document should be prepared, either an NRE, a uh, natural resource evaluation, or a technical memo, and why? What implementation measures do you think there would be for this project, and what commitments are there for this project? And just to um, work backwards, to give you guys a reminder of all of the um, effect determinations that we concluded and the wetland impacts. So we'll walk through the answers now together. Um, a natural resource evaluation should be developed because Section 7 consultation is needed for federally listed species and an individual permit for wetland impacts will be needed. Implementation measures include erosion and control measures, uh, wetland permitting and wood stork mitigation. The commitments that would be needed for this project based on um, our effect determinations uh, include the standard protection measures for eastern indigo snake, and we said we would incorporate wildlife shelves into the design to minimize impacts to Florida panther. So now we're going to go through a second example. Um, for our next example, we'll use an interchange project along an interstate. The interchange is being reconfigured from a diamond to a cloverleaf interchange. The species that came up during our database searches include gopher tortoise, wood stork, and Everglades snail kite. Wetland impacts are limited to a tenth of an acre from an adjacent swale. And uh, once again, there's no essential fish habitat for our example. So from our field assessment, we concluded that staff observed two potentially occupied gopher tortoise burrows. Prior to construction, FDOT will complete a 100% gopher tortoise survey and obtain a gopher tortoise relocation permit from FWC if necessary. We've determined that no adverse effect is anticipated to gopher tortoises as a result of the proposed project. The project falls within a core foraging area for wood stork colonies, and impacts to suitable foraging habitat are less than half an acre. Using the key, we determine that the project may affect, not likely to adversely affect, the wood stork. And for Everglades snail kite, uh, we determine that Everglades snail kites are not known to occur in the project area, and wetlands that contain um, apple snails needed for foraging are not present we conclude that the project will have no effect on Everglades snail kite. And wetland impacts would qualify under a general permit. So we'll have the same uh, suite of questions here for you. Uh, what type of document should be prepared, an NRE or a technical memo and why? And what implementation measures and commitments would there be for this project?
and this abbreviation here is uh, no adverse effect anticipated, not likely to adversely affect, and no effect. So our answers here, um, we would expect that a technical memo would be prepared because species consultation is not required. The conclusions were no effect or not likely to adversely affect through a key. The key for the wood stork indicated that the not likely to adversely affect determination required uh, no further consultation with the service. Um, so because no consultation is needed for an external agency, that's why a technical memo would be prepared. And um, also because wetland impacts can be permitted through um, either a general permit or, um, yeah, so. And then implementation measures could include conducting a 100% gopher tortoise survey and implementing erosion and sediment control measures and obtaining any necessary authorizations for wetland impacts. And we do not uh, anticipate any commitments out of this project. So those are our two examples that we'll run through and that's the conclusion of our uh, prepared presentation today. So thank you guys for joining. Um, we'll now have time for some open question and answer. Thanks, Erica. This is um, Katasha, just wanted to share, we have a couple of questions regarding which NREs require review by OEM, if you could go back over that. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, natural resource evaluations, because they're being prepared for external agency review, uh, should be reviewed by OEM. So it would be for NREs developed for um, any type of class of action um, and also local agency projects. And um, I think that's all of them. For projects that are non-major state actions, and state environmental impact reports, they do not require OEM review. Thanks. Our next question is, if something is listed in the implementation measure, should it also be listed as a commitment? No, so um, implementation measures and commitments are kind of two separate ideas. Um, commitments are things that need to be documented and carried forward through the various project phases, phases um, to fulfill external agency obligations, whereas implementation measures are things that we do as part of standard FDOT practice, and we would be uh, fulfilling those obligations regardless. So um, they should not be repeated in the two lists. Thank you. Um, our next question is, do you still prepare an NRE if you have to prepare a BA to get a BO? Yes, an NRE should be prepared. Um, and sometimes the timing of doing formal consultation with um, either US Fish and Wildlife Service or National Marines Fisheries Service might not always align with um, pd and &E, so it might be that you're doing um, a natural resource evaluation in pd and &E, and you're documenting your anticipated effects, but maybe you're not initiating um, formal consultation until a later time in the road where maybe it would be an NRE addendum or something similar um, to act as that biological assessment. Um, and it's important, like I said, to uh, make sure that you're following the external, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service um, biological assessment guidelines when you're preparing an NRE for to serve as a BA. Thanks. Our next question was about when the revised guidelines will be published and made available, and we are looking to get those out for everyone. Um, probably very early in June. We are trying to get those on the website at the same time that our updated pd &E manual is published. And we should know that date here relatively soon as well. And again, anticipating early June on that one. Uh, then another question is, um, <clears throat> can we get a copy of this presentation? And yes, this uh, presentation, this recording will be made available on our OEM website. Um, let me go to the next question. So 
Um, Eastern indigo snake provisions and manatee in water work um, conditions are often permit requirements. Why would they not be considered a standard um, or typical agency requirement as an implementation measure? Erica, do you wanna address that one? Sure, um, because those are um, external agency provisions that even though they might be um, included as a permit condition later down the road, typically a natural resource evaluation um, or even a technical memo would be being developed before permitting occurs. So it would just be ensuring to the agency that we're following these conditions and we will implement them in construction um, to justify our effect determination that we're making in the NRE. Katasha, do you have anything else to add to that? Oh, that's what I would say too, thank you. And then um, if you have, all, like if you have one species that requires a, a BA, do you still have to prepare an NRE? Um, and I would say yes, you still would prepare a natural resource evaluation to act as your biological assessment. And you would just address those other two issues, wetlands and EFH, at the beginning to say that they, those resources are not part of your project. But in order to be kind of compliant with our procedures, we'd still have an NRE. <clears throat> so one other question um, I've had, so I guess there's some discrepancies between um, certain district preferences or um, projects maybe um, with species survey requirements, whether, there should, whether they should be completed in pd &E or whether they can be held off until design. And um, this is an issue that needs to be uh, addressed with OEM before there's a decision made. So it is uh, our expectation at OEM that we complete consultation during the pd &E, if at all possible. We need to be able to provide some assurance to um, the agencies and the public in order to show that we're doing the best we can to get all of our project impacts and effect determinations decided up front during pd &E to get our NEPA decision made, if possible. We know that there's times where that's just not, uh, you know, always going to be uh, situation that we can uh, you know accommodate there's going to be times where we have bridge issues where we don't have all the design there's going to be times where um, you know you may end up in a situation where you have to go out and do multiple surveys and we're very aware of that that concern by by districts especially the ones that are affected by that on a regular basis but we don't just decide to push off surveys to later um, just because you know they may be pricey or timely or whatever so we need to be coordinating with your uh, pdc at oem your project delivery coordinator um, to make sure that that's the approach that we all are in agreement with taking before uh, making that decision. Um, we go to the next question. We still got quite a few more. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Let me see. Are there going to be more species keys from US Fish and Wildlife Service? And I'm not 100% sure of the answer to that exactly. I do know that the US Fish and Wildlife Service and Army Corps of Engineers have been working on a number of initiatives in the panhandle specifically. They call them slopes and I don't have that acronym uh, memorized, but they are looking at moving some of that same sort of um, uh, process into peninsular Florida. So there may be some more keys coming soon from them. Um, but in addition to that, uh, FDOT specifically is working with US Fish and Wildlife Service on some programmatic approaches, which will be similar to keys, where you will have to document how you've made your effect determinations uh, in your NRE and in your environmental documents, uh, if you're using those programmatic um, uh, resources. So there, there will be others um, similar to that coming out in the near future from the DOT side. So how about a couple wetland questions too? You may need to um, help jump in on this discussion. There is a question about um, state versus federal jurisdiction. So for example, isolated wetlands are not regulated by the Corps, which would affect the impacts in the conceptual mitigation plan. So how would you suggest that those two different types of uh, wetlands be discussed in the NRE? If you 
if you have that information, go ahead and include that um, in the NRE so that the agencies will know. And then, of course, it will impact the mitigation that's going to be required. So that also helps inform what mitigation that you might need as well. So if that if information is available, um, definitely include it in the NRE. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to scroll back up to one other wetland question, um, and we may need to unmute our uh, participant for this one if it's unclear, but it's it's been a question regarding um, including a jurisdictional determination and separate wetland mitigation plans, um, or do you just include all wetland impacts together? Do we want to unmute maybe for that question? I think so. What's that? Okay. Let me see. So, um, <clears throat> Jason, can you hear us? Yeah, Maybe. I can hear you. I'm sorry to ask this kind of a loaded question. Um, th this has come up on on several projects where I've that we've had that are either on the the Lake Wells Ridge or have been um, where we've had the state apply special basin criteria that wouldn't necessarily um, apply to uh, mitigation for federal impacts. And so one of the things that, that I've struggled with in the past, and this goes all the way back to, you know, doing WERs and, and all that is, do you, do you want it broken down, um, you know, based on, you know, vers state versus federal jurisdiction, if, if there's a difference, which the question I, what I think I heard too say was yes. But in other events, if you have, you know, so, for example, in Orlando, if you have projects in the Lake Jessup Basin, the, the St. John's River Water Management District typically doesn't want to go um, to allow out-of-basin mitigation. But the core will do it because the huck that regulates it is larger. Um, and so what it can do is it can sort of create a, a, a more complex conceptual mitigation plan because we'll have to say, okay, well, you know, we need this many credits for this and this many credits are going to be applied to the core. And then, well, we're going to trip the, the wood stork, so we need to make sure that the wood stork um, credit gets applied to the core credits. I guess my question is, do you want to get into that sort of deep dive in an NRE, or do you want to, you know, just simply say we anticipate, you know, this many forested, this many herbaceous, you know, estuarine, whatever, and just kind of leave it at that? Uh, I, I don't feel like there's the, the guidance really says if that makes sense. And this is too, I think my response to that is it's just going to depend on the project and then the timing associated with it uh, as to when you're going to go into permitting. If you have that information available, I think it's appropriate to put it in the NRE. If you don't, I think it's appropriate to do it the other way around. A lot of your questions um, have to do with permitting. And then oftentimes, once we move from PD&E into design, we get more detailed information and we can get into those details to share with the agency at that time. So what we do as a part of the NRE is share what information we have. If it's that level of detail, um, then I think it's appropriate to have it in there. And if you don't, it's appropriate to do it the other way around. So it's just going to be project specific and probably associated with the timing as you know how fast you're going to go into permitting as well. Natasha, did you want to add yep. anything else to that? No, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Jason. No, I, I think that's great. I mean, that's 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 pretty much what we're doing. I just, you know, I, I had never seen anything, you know, as, as far as the guidance came around that said, yeah, do this. But, you know, I, I think it's obviously a common sense thing to do. I'm good. Thank All you. Right, thanks. Okay, so there's a question about do lot projects need to follow NRE guidelines? 
And I think the answer to that question is yes, because lap projects are required to follow the PD &E manual um, in general. And so that would be the expectation. Um, recognizing that the NRE guidelines are guidelines and we're not necessarily um, going to require folks to go make massive revisions if they haven't, you know, um, done that through a lap project. I recognize there's some challenges there with that, but they should definitely be kind of you know, provided that information and, and they need to follow them as closely as they possibly can. And we do review those, as Erica said before, at OEM, and we do initiate the formal consultation on those if required. So depending on that level of consultation that will be needed, if they're missing things from the NRE that are, are required to complete that consultation, they'll definitely be asked to um, provide that so that it's a sufficient document for consultation. Um, just a couple more questions here. So for projects without a pd &E, a minor project, um, are NREs still to be prepared? Isn't, um, isn't a tech memo sufficient? And a tech memo is sufficient if you hit those three requirements that Erica covered earlier in the presentation. Um, Eric, I don't know if you can um, maybe jump back to that or, or reiterate those three um, points. Yeah, um, I can certainly go back to the beginning, but it's essentially whether or not um, consultation is required. Um, Here we go. So um, if any of these things under natural resource evaluation are triggered, then an NRE should be prepared instead of a technical memo. And that would require a OEM review. Thanks. Two, another one for you. Is it appropriate to group wetlands with similar characteristics and UMAM parameters in UMAM summaries as we would do in permitting, or does each wetland need to be um, treated separately for the UMAM? Uh, this is a common question for, um, if, if back in the day they talked about people who are lumpers and splitters, I think it makes sense to put them together if they are like, uh, that makes the most sense to me. So that is my personal preference, um, but I've seen it both ways. But it definitely, I think if you have similar characteristics, you can group them all into one and have that described in the document that way. Okay, we'll just find one or two more questions. There's still a lot of questions here, so we'll try to answer your questions um, offline if we don't get to them. So if a project isn't covered by a mitigation bank, um, to what extent do you develop a conceptual um, creation, restoration, or enhancement plan for the NRE? Um, to do, is that another topic that you could help address? Um, if we don't have a mitigation option um, that we normally follow the hierarchy where we go to a mitigation bank or for those areas that have uh, mitigation services available with your water management districts, we have to come up with that option three, which is to create something ourselves. So to the extent possible, we have to come up with a solution for those adverse impacts, otherwise we cannot move forward. So uh, you need to identify potentially where that mitigation is going to be um, and what you're going to need to get the appropriate lift to offset the adverse impacts. Great, thanks. And the last question was just um, whether OEM was considering developing any sort of guidance for supporting documentation for the design phase. And the answer to that is currently we are not um, looking to do anything uh, to standardize for the design side. So with that, um, any final comments, Erica or two? Nothing for me. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. All right, no, no additional comments for me as well. Okay, thank you all very much.